Well, that is one of the great parts of Johnson Ferry is that we have people that gather to pray specifically for the nations, to pray for a whole host of issues, and we want to be a praying church. And that's where we're going today as we talk about prayer in this series that we've called uh, Jesus First. But before we jump into today's topic and the text for today, just two things I'd ask for you to be praying about, particularly over the next two weeks. One is the big move day on uh, March the 1st which will be, of course, a big part of the MOVE conference. I'm, I'm so looking forward to delivering a message in that conference, so looking forward to what God does, and uh, looking forward to see what we can give this year above and beyond to help fuel the Great Commission. But here's the second thing. Next week, the 23rd, uh, we're going to wrap up our Jesus First series, and at the, at the end, I'm going to have a, just a card we give you that is going to say, hey, here's where I'm giving, this is what I, where I'm putting Jesus First in 2020. We're not asking to do anything with it. That's between you and the Lord, except for just to kind of lay it down. And also next week, I think a lot of times we have friends and family members who know a lot about Jesus, know a lot about God, have been to church a bunch of times. But honestly, they don't really know what it looks like to put Jesus first. And so I'm going to dedicate a good part of next week thinking like I'm sitting down to have coffee with you or a friend of yours. And they're like, hey, what, what's the whole, what's it even mean to have Jesus at the center of my life? And just to unpack that in a very clear, basic way. So I, I want you to be praying for next week. I want to be inviting, bringing people next week. And who knows, maybe next week will be a huge day of just celebrating people moving from death to life. People moving from being an unfollower to now a follower of Jesus. And let's just see what he does. So I'd really love your prayer this week as we head into the wrap up of Jesus First next week. Today, though, we're going to talk about prayer. I bet you don't know the, the name Jeremiah Lanfear. Probably not a name that rattles off your tongue. We don't even have a picture of the guy. But the guy is someone God used in a profound way. A businessman, was not a preacher, not a pastor, just a, a business guy in New York City, 1850s. Now, I know we think that our day and age is filled with chaos and, and distraction and collision and all, all that kind of stuff when we look at our world today and the politics and how we talk to each other and treat each other, all, all that kind of stuff. I'm not denying anything about that, but the 1850s was crazy. This is a time where the nation was divided, particularly over the issue of slavery, which would lead to a civil war. This was a time where the industrial north was colliding with the agrarian south as to what kind of economy would this country have. It was a day where religion was expanding uh, out of the cities into the frontier. It was a day of a lot of economic turmoil. In fact, $8 million sunk on a boat because of a hurricane. That'd be about $550 million today. It caused a run on the banks in New York City, and they had the panic of 1857. It, it was just, a, it was a time where the people of this nation were desperate, were hurting. And here's the thing, when, when God moves in a powerful way, there are always two ingredients. Now, there may be more than these two, but there's always at least these two. What are they? Number one, there's great pain. And, and we will not pray to God until we have to pray to God. That's just the reality. And pain drives us to God. And the second thing is what we just said. It's a great prayer. So Jeremiah Lanfear knew that people praying was a part of God bringing about an awakening. And so, so he, because he, he knew something about advertising, he created these little handbills that talked about this great citywide prayer gathering. If all of us could come together and pray together, God would move in a powerful way. He passed out 20,000 of them. And he was, it was all towards this one day, September, 1857. And he was praying about it, expecting all this huge crowd to come. And the day came. You know how many people, people showed up? Six. Six people. 20,000, six people show up. So they pray. And they prayed about the needs that they had in their life. They prayed about the needs for their city and for the world. And they left about an hour later. And they said, well, let's do it again next week. Except next week, 15 people came. The week after that, about 40 people came. And this thing started to take off. Not only fill up where they were praying, it filled up rooms across the city. It, it actually spread then from New York City to other major cities like Philadelphia, even down to Dallas, came down south. In fact, that whole kind of revival went over across the seas into Wales and Scotland. In fact, 
Someone called this the 1857 Layman's Prayer Revival, and God saved about a million people across the planet because people were praying. Now, you may think it was crazy or super emotional or people were falling out. It, it wasn't any of that. It was very orderly. In fact, they had these rules. You can see this kind of rule sheet from the Layman's Prayer Revival. They said that your prayers should not exceed more than five minutes. Some of you would struggle with that. You couldn't bring up more than two and, and no controverted points. In other words, this is not a time to debate, you know, second, third tier doctrines, things that are important, but they're not really the main thing. That, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to get on our knees and our face and cry out to God and say, God, move. And he did. We often think that when God's people get together to pray, that will bring about revival. But actually, when God's people get together to pray, that is revival. So today we want to talk about prayer, the power of prayer. In fact, at the end of our services all day today, we've, we've asked our people to pray out loud. It's been fun watching people throughout the sermons all day kind of trickle out before the end of the, end of the sermon. And I'm watching all of you, so... But we want to pray today. We want to be a people of prayer. In fact, Johnson Ferry has groups like you saw, the one that gathers to pray for the nations. We have all kinds of groups like that. In fact, if you'll just go to johnsonferry.org uh, forward slash prayer, you'll, you'll see some of the different ways you can get engaged in being prayed for and praying with uh, other believers, followers of Jesus. Because Jesus talked about prayer. So today we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer, and it's found in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 13. That's part of the Sermon on the Mount. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we want to give you a Bible. And we'd love for you to take it home if you don't have a Bible. Every single week we, we get around God's Word in this time of Bible study, and we, we open it up, try to understand it, and certainly then try to apply it. So if you don't have a Bible, uh, just open one up or turn one on. And we're going to read the Lord's Prayer. Now, typically, I have you stand and I read the text and you listen. Today, though, I'm going to have you stand, but we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Now, I've chosen the New American Standard Version, so if you grew up with lots of these and vows and transgressions, you're going to struggle here. But let's see how we can do. Will we all stand together and let's just say out loud together the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Here's what he said. Let's say it together. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we now come to you and ask that we would take this prayer that a lot of us have heard, a lot of us have said, and Lord, would you help us to understand it in a way that accurately gets at what Jesus was talking about. And not only would we understand it, but Lord, would you help us to apply it this week. And we'll pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start out by just saying, and this is a massive assumption, that a lot of us in this room struggle to pray. Not all of us, but I'm just talking about me. And you might think, hey, I'm a pastor, therefore this is just kind of what we do. And, and granted, I'm probably in a lot more meetings where we pray than, than your meetings that you have where you go to work. But just to be real honest with you, I often struggle to have a quality prayer life. And maybe you do too. And I, I think there's a couple reasons for it. I thought about this week. In fact, I just put five reasons real quick why I think a lot of us struggle in our prayer life. So here they are. Number one, it's just time. Not that we don't have time, but we don't make time. It's not a priority. Now, Jesus would often set aside time specifically to pray. And if the Son of God need to pray, how much more do we need to pray? But we just don't make time. Number two is distraction. 
We live in a world where we have just stuff coming to us all the time. We're on social media all the time. We're just used to things changing constantly all the time. And, and it's hard then to just sit down and, and, and just to be focused and pray to the Lord. A lot of us have kind of ADHD prayers. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you're praying, it's like, you know, God, I just pray for that guy that I met the other day at Target and all the stuff that he has going on in his life. I pray for him. And, man, I need to go to Target. I need to get some coffee. <laughs> and some milk. You ever, yeah. You ever, you ever do that? Is that just me? Y'all, y'all ever do that? <laughs> Look, a bird. Y'all ever do that? So, we're, just, we're just distracted people, and it shows up in our prayer life. Number three is a misunderstanding. Sometimes we, we just fail to appreciate the power of prayer. We have this kind of fatalism. Hey, God knows everything. He's going to answer however he wants. What difference does my prayer make? Now, I know that sounds good, but when you read the Bible, this same sovereign God responds to the prayers of his people. Number four is self-confidence. We treat prayer li- kind of like we do our spare tire. When you, when you leave the parking lot today, none of you will be thinking about the spare tire on your car unless you have a flat. And then you'll whip out this tool that you have. And we do that with prayer. We, we live our life dependent on our own talents, our own gifts, our own abilities, our own you know, winsomeness. And then, and then maybe, God, if we need it, we'll throw in a little prayer at the end so you can be a part of the process. Maybe a, a lot of the reasons we all struggle in prayer is just we don't know how. Someone may say to you, well, prayer is just talking to God. But did you actually know that there are ways in which we should pray? Jesus taught his disciples to, to pray. In fact, it's the only thing that's recorded that they asked him to teach them. They didn't say, you know, would you teach us to preach? Would you teach us to heal? Would you teach us to do this or do that? But they did say, teach us to pray. And Jesus taught his followers how to pray. Jesus wants to teach you how to pray. Today we're looking at prayer that actually works. Pretty simple idea. Nothing in this text is just revolutionary, but it's a matter of just putting into practice what Jesus gave us to do. So here's what we're going to look at today, this one big idea. Prayer that works requires two ingredients. Prayer that works requires, number one, the right motive, and number two, the right method. The right motive and the right method. So the reason why we pray, the motive is a big part, and the method we pray, meaning what we're praying for, the how, is also A big part. So if we're going to pray in a way that Jesus wants his disciples to pray, it requires the right motive and the right method. So let's look first at at the motive. And Jesus covers this in verse 5 through 8. Now, I want you to hear, he's going to give two negative examples of what not to be like in your prayer life, and then a positive example. See if you can hear these as we read verse 5 through 8. Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Two negative examples, one positive. The first negative example, he says, are the hypocrites. Don't be like the hypocrites when you pray. When we talk about prayer, particularly in our day and age, even as Christians, we tend to talk about it as a private thing. It's something that we do privately. And he's going to get to the motive of being private in your prayer life. But if you grew up in the time of Jesus, grew up in a Jewish culture, you learned prayers from the time you were a little kid, and you would come to a worship service like this, and you would audibly say prayers out loud. That was a normal part of worshiping together with the people of God. But Jesus said what happened is there are people who would stand up to pray 
And they sounded very religious and eloquent. And you would sit there and go, wow, I just, I could never pray like that. But Jesus said, here's the problem. Their motive is they want you to be impressed by their prayers. And even though it sounds good, it's not really about them and God. It's about them impressing you. It's like a kid. You know, if you have kids, it's fascinating. There's this, there's this magic age where, you know, most kids will wear just about anything you give them to wear. And somewhere there's this magic age where labels become very important. And they, they want to present themselves in a way that they feel makes them look a certain way. And, and these guys are praying with a, with a label. And Jesus says, don't be like them. The second negative example was in verse 7. He said it's the Gentiles. He says they have meaningless repetition. It's a fascinating word in the, in the, in the Greek. And it's really an onomatopoeia. You remember those words where they are, what they sound like? And it might be translated this, don't, don't babble on like the Gentiles who are babbling to God. See, there was a belief amongst the Greeks, Gentiles, pagans, that there are gods, little g gods, all over the place. And those little gods will respond to humans if we're really passionate in our prayer. So the louder you are, the more bold you are, the more you pray, the more you shout, the crazier you are, the more emotional it gets. Well, then, then they'll have to. In fact, Seneca, the philosopher, he said, fatigue the gods. And Jesus says, I don't want you to be like either one of them. I, I want you to be a, a person who wants to pray in secret. He's not dismissing public prayers. Jesus prayed publicly. There's nothing wrong with praying, praying publicly. But the point here is, what's your motive? He says, go into your inner room. Most of his followers did not have big houses. Most of them did not have a room dedicated solely to prayer, though people today do that. And that's a, that's a good thing to have a room that you've dedicated to prayer. But that's not really what Jesus is saying. He's saying, go to that place where they can't see you. Go to the place where no one knows who you are. Almost, almost hide from people because it's there you meet your heavenly Father. Because your motive is not to be impressive. Your motive is to connect with Him. So do you have that inner place that you pray? And I know you think your life is crazy, but we all can find an inner place to just pray with our heavenly Father. Susanna uh, Wesley, she was the mother of Methodism. Her sons were John and Charles Wesley, who started what we now call the Methodist Church. They were two of 19 kids that she had. And yet they learned a lot about following Jesus from their mother. It was said that she would sit in the corner and she would take her apron. And even in the midst of 19 kids, she would pull the apron over her head and would just sit there and pray to God. And the kids know, hey, you don't mess with mama when she's got the apron over her head <laughs> because she's connecting with Jesus. And that, that's the principle, connecting with Jesus. And he says, don't, don't use a bunch of meaningless words going on and all. You ever met people like that? Martin Luther, the, the great reformer, he said, prayer should be brief, frequent, and intense. Charles Spurgeon, the, the famous preacher in the 1800s, one of his big pet peeves is when people would get up and just pray on and on and on and on. And, you know, he had church service here, and he's in one of these big, like, throne preacher chairs over here, right? And this guy would come out, and he would pray. And if the guy just went on and on and on, Spurgeon would just get up and start preaching. <laughs> it's kind of like, all right, you're done. And Jesus says, look, look, prayers are not measured in length. They're measured in weight. Jesus' prayer, he teaches us here, doesn't take very long. But it's the contents and it's the motive. That's what makes it the kind of prayer that works. So what's your motive to pray? Back in 2014, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, there was a diner, Mary's Gourmet Diner. The owner, who's a believer, wanted to um, help those who were prayers. So if you would come in the restaurant, you'd pray before your meal, and she saw you, she would often give you a 15% discount on your meal. And this caused lots of people to come to the restaurant, also caused lots of backlash. She eventually got rid of it because it caused so much problem. And I, I just thought about that in my own life. I wonder if, if I went to that restaurant and I knew that I'd get a discount, why would I pray? <laughs> to thank God for the food or to get the 15% off? How about both? That might be an option, right? But it does get at what our motive is. 
And Jesus says, no matter how long you pray, what kind of prayers you pray, just make sure that they're motivated by the rewards of a father who sees you in secret. So the prayers that he wants us to pray require the right motive, but then he gets to the right method. And this is where he unpacks for us what we often call the Lord's Prayer. It should probably be called the Disciples' Prayer because it's the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples to pray. What we see when we study this text, a lot of you know this, you probably memorized some version of this, we already said this once a day, is that we might see that Jesus is basing this prayer off a very familiar Jewish prayer called the Kaddish, and I may be completely butchering that pronunciation. But this is a prayer that many Jews would pray as they would gather to worship. This is a version of it. It would sound like this. Exalted and hallowed be his great name in the world which he created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of the whole household of Israel speedily and at a near time and say amen. Do you hear parts of that prayer that sound very much like what Jesus is praying? What Jesus may be doing is saying, look, you all know this prayer publicly. You know what it's about, the kingdom of God that's coming to his people. But here's how I want you to pray it. So he gives them six requests. And we want to think about what are these six requests and what they have to do with my life. Right now, you may be going through a challenge, a health challenge, a relational challenge, a financial challenge, a challenge of making a big decision in your life. I want to encourage you to take these six requests and put them on top of your challenge as you pray for that thing this week. And we see that in the Lord's Prayer, there are really six requests, and we could divide them into two sections. One section is a section about God, and it starts with Him. The second section is about us. Now, by us, I don't mean us just as individuals, but the words are all plural. We, us, our. It's about us as followers of Jesus praying these things together. So the God prayers are focused on him setting apart his name. It's focused on his kingdom. It's focused on his will. And once we pray those, then we shift over into praying for us, which starts with our daily bread. It, It starts with us being forgivers. And then it goes to God delivering us from evil. So let's just go in a straightforward way through these requests. I want you to be thinking about how you could be praying these this week. What's the first request? It's this, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We tend to go to prayer and it usually starts with something like this, you know, God help me, I need this, and you know, it's coming on, I got this big meeting this week, and I got this interview I got to deal with, and I got this person I need to help with, and I got this, and I got this, and me, and I got this. And all those are not bad things. In fact, Jesus will get to where we're praying for our needs, just don't start there. It starts with worship. It starts with praise. It says, it says, our Father. Do you know what an amazing word that is, Father? A lot of you did not grow up with good fathers. That word does not bring a positive thing to your head. But he's your heavenly father. He's the father you always wanted. He's not just God or the man upstairs or the almighty. He's your daddy. And he's a father who is in heaven. He has a heavenly perspective of your life. You, you can't even see into this afternoon. You can't even see into the next hour. And yet this father of yours, if you are his child, he sees from a heavenly perspective your whole life. Our father who is in heaven, and then he uses the word hallowed. Now that's an old word that we don't use a lot, but it basically means God set apart your name. God, make your name famous. God, make your glory shown. God, vindicate yourself on behalf of your people. God, show off, show your glory, set apart your name. We are so flippant with the name of God. We use it all the time. OMG, Jesus. I mean, we we, we throw out the name of God all the time. And, 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 Jesus, and Jesus here is not just saying, hey, look, don't use God's name as a cuss word. But he's saying the great prayers start with saying, God, do something for you. It's about you. It's not about me. It's about you. And great prayers start with God. Set your name apart. And because we do that, we get to the second request, which is this. God, may your kingdom come. 
It's about your kingdom, not my kingdom, your kingdom. You know, we live in this tension of the kingdom of God. We see the end of the Bible where it says that Jesus is coming again to establish his kingdom. And we look forward as his followers to that day. But it also says that even now, in some ways, we are in the kingdom of God. This tension of already, but not yet. But we're looking forward to that kingdom and we're praying, God, would your kingdom come? And we need to be reminded that we need to pray prayers that start with concern for God's kingdom and not our kingdom. Did you know that there's a presidential election in 2020? Did you know that? Now, earthly leaders have their role, and I'm not saying that we should be uninvolved or unengaged or uninformed. I think we should be all those things. I think we have a role to play. But what you're going to see this year, if you're a follower of Jesus, like we do every four years, you're going to see how many people have made an idol of the kingdom of this world. And it's a time for us as followers of Jesus to show that we are actually citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And it starts with our prayer life. God, it's about your kingdom. It's about what you want to do. It's not about me. It's about you. Your kingdom come. And what goes with that is a third request, and your will be done. A lot of you right now pray prayers. God, I need to know your will. I'm, I'm, I'm facing this decision. I have this hardship. I don't, I don't know what to do. God, what is your will? And that is the heartbeat of prayer. It starts with, with acknowledging that his will is superior to your will. We often think, I think unintentionally, is that if I come to God with a list of things, then God will adjust his will to fit what I think I need for my life. But what you find in really God-centered, God-glorifying prayers is that they are not about God aligning his will to our will, but they are about us aligning our will to the will of God. If you're in a boat and you throw that hook onto the shore, and it catches, and you start pulling yourself, let me ask you, are you pulling the shore to the boat, or are you pulling the boat to the shore? When we pray these kind of prayers, we are pulling our will to the will of God. And it helps us to live, I love what this, John Calvin said this, he said, we are to live with one foot raised, yeah, I'm, I'm in the kingdom of this world, but my heart and my head are in the kingdom of God. You see how these prayers start? It doesn't start with your list or your to-dos or your stress or whatever. It starts with, God, let me praise you. And what's amazing is how then when we start with God in that order, how it shifts how we think about our needs and our wants. Now, I, I know what the great philosopher Mick Jagger said when he said, we can't always get what we want, <laughs> but we get what we how do you know that? We get what we need. It's amazing how I, I will go to God with my needs, which are not always what God wants. But I start with his name, his glory, his kingdom. It's amazing how what he wants becomes what I need. So once we start with God, well, then we move to the us section where we pray these other prayers. These are ones you know. The fourth one is this, God, give us our daily bread. Do you remember in the Old Testament when the Israelites were in the desert and God would provide bread for them every day? If you fast forward to Revelation, you see that in the coming kingdom of God, we'll sit at this banquet table with the Father, yet another meal. So whether God provided then or God provided in the future, what we're praying today is God provide my daily needs. God provide my daily bread. What, what if you have a child, and just imagine this child, you went to their room and they weren't in there, and you looked in the closet and you saw sandwiches and crackers and jars of peanut butter and candy bars, and you, you, you saw all this food. I mean, not where it was like, oh, they're, you know, sneaking some food, but like there's a lot of food in here. And you asked your child and said, what, what is going on? Why do you have so much food in your closet? And they said, well, and they got this kind of tear in their eye. I, I didn't know if you were going to give me any food tomorrow. And that would break your heart. 
Because you think, I'm your parent. I love you. I, I'm going to always provide for you. I'm going to always have something for you as best as I can. I'm, I'm gonna, but God, I love you. I'm your father. And that's what God is saying. Hey, look, I know it seems bleak, but you can trust me. I will, al- I will always provide your daily need. I will always provide your bread. It may not always come in the time you want. It may not always come in the way you think it should come. But trust me. Trust me. I will provide for you. Give us this day our daily bread. And is that not a perspective check that we just need to be thankful in life? You know, we complain about so much. We complain about our jobs. We complain about our relationships. We complain about our bank accounts. We complain about this and about that. And when you have an attitude of gratitude and you're just thankful, God, thank, thanks for that job. I know it's stressful, but thank, thank you. A lot of people don't even have a job. God, thank you that I can provide for my family. Thank you for this health crisis. Because I'm trusting in you like I've never trusted in you before. God, thank you for this. That, you see how it's just daily bread. And when you start with God, that's much easier to do. What's well, the fifth request? Forgive us our debts as we, as, all, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Jesus here is not teaching that our forgiveness is based on how well you forgive others. To teach that would be to neglect all the different scriptures about what salvation is all about. And and if you're here today, you you don't know what this is all about. It's basically about the fact that while bread might be your greatest physical need, forgiveness is your greatest spiritual need. And being a follower of Jesus isn't about just keeping rules or being a good person or making sure that you do more good things, you do bad things. No, it's about being a forgiven person. There's an old hymn that we used to sing that that had a line that went like this. uh, My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And that's the heart of salvation. That when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died to forgive you of your sin. And when he rose from the grave, he did it so that you could live with the promise of abundant and eternal life. And you could be forgiven. That's your greatest spiritual need is to be forgiven. And here's the thing. When we realize how we don't deserve forgiveness and yet are forgiven, it shapes how we treat other people. Because here's the deal. Forgiven people forgive. And if you really, really struggle with forgiveness, it might mean, not necessarily, but it might mean that you haven't truly been forgiven. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. Well, here's the sixth request. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Every time I say evil, I feel like you have to say evil with a pinky. But anyways, do not lead us into temptation. Deliver us from evil. (laughs) Here's the deal. God does not tempt people to sin. He's not the author of sin. He does never purposely lead you to sin. But the same word for temptation is the same word for testing in the Greek. And we do go through tests. Jesus went through tests and trials. When you read the New Testament, we see that there's a cost to following Jesus. There's a cost to living in this broken world. It's interesting that it says, don't, don't, you know, don't lead us into these tests of testing, but deliver us. Deliver us from what? Evil. In fact, it uses the definite article in, the, in this passage, the evil. Does that mean Satan? Does that mean just evil in the world? It doesn't say. Maybe it includes both. But what we need to be reminded is that we all face tests. We all face the brokenness of this world. We all face injustices in this world. We all face struggles. We all face it when the doctor says something about our mortality that we weren't prepared for. We all face it when we are hurt by people. We all face it when we say things or post things that we wish we could take back again. We, we all make sinful decisions all the time. And the great hope of the gospel is that Jesus will one day deliver us from this world of testing. And I think what Jesus' prayer is getting at here is saying, God, help me rely on your strength and not my strength as I go through the test of this world. So do you see just how practical this prayer is? These six things, these six requests. Now, I want us to think about putting this into practice 
and we're about to wrap up here. Two, two assignments for you this week. Number one is that I want to encourage you to pray this prayer for the next six days. Now, whether you pray it exactly or you break it up, let's not get too legalistic about it. But maybe right now you're facing a challenging time or a big decision or going through a trial or whatever. What if you just laid this prayer on top of that thing for the next six days and it started with, hey, God, you're my father. You have a heavenly perspective. God, make, make my life be about your name, not mine. God, I know I'm facing this thing and it's keeping me up at night. I'm stressed out about it and I, I, you know, I'm worried so much about it. But God, that's all about my kingdom. Would you make my priority your kingdom? And you see how we do this? It's about your will. And then it's about thanking him for his daily bread. And it's about, you see how this works? I want to encourage you to do that for the next six days. The second assignment is something that we've done all morning. And that's something we're going to do right now which is we're going to pray together. Now, we don't do this most Sundays. In fact, it may be a long time since we've done this, but we're going to actually pray out loud together. Now, if you came here by yourself, you don't know anybody, no one's going to force you to do anything. If you don't want to pray with someone else, you don't have to. You can just do it in your seat. But a lot of us in this room know people in this room or, or kind of know people in this room, or even if you don't know them, this is a great chance to meet them. And here's what we're going to do. In just a second, I, I'm going to have you get in pairs and if you need to get up to, you know, get closer to somebody, do it, fine. Or if you're sitting right there, you don't have to move, that's fine. And then I'm going to lead us. I'm going to start out the prayer. And then I'm going to stop talking and give you about three minutes. So it's not long, maybe a minute-ish each. And I'm not giving you a specific prayer prompt. I'm just saying, hey, look, take one of these six requests, or if you want to combine them all or two of them, whatever, I don't care. But let's just, let's, let's just Lift up the Lord's Prayer to God about a situation in your life. could be about our church. could be about some issue in our nation. could be about anything you want. And I'll give you about a minute and a half, and then I'm not going to tell you when, but the other person, they have about a minute and a half, and then I'm going to come at the end and then wrap us all up. But there's no sweeter sound than the sound of God's people praying. So right now, if you would, if you need to get up, do that right now and find somebody. This isn't going to take long, maybe five minutes tops. So stand up, you know, find somebody, get, get a partner or somebody. <laughs> All right. And we're going to audibly pray to the Lord just in a way that each other would hear one another and then the Lord will hear it, of course. And let me, um, let me start us out here this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now and we just thank you that you're a God who hears our prayers, that you're a God who loves us and you're a God who wants us to call you Father. So Lord, this is a time that we've dedicated to pray to you. We want to be a praying people. We want to believe in the power of prayer, not because of the act of prayer, but the God who listens to prayer and responds to prayer. So Lord, maybe there's one of those six requests that has kind of been burned in our hearts over the last few minutes, and that's the one that's kind of rising to the top. Whatever it is, Lord, whatever we feel led to pray for right now, whether it's for our church, for our nation, Maybe it's a prayer of blessing over the other person that's praying with our people right now, whoever it is. I pray right now, God, that you would hear us as we, the people of Johnson Ferry, pray out loud to you. Let's do that right now. Let's pray together. You guys pray. <laughs>